One of the core teachings of many faith traditions is to love your enemies. Christianity may have the clearest expression of them all. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus Christ unreservedly tells a crowd, love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. Matthew's account captures the quote in a similar manner. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, Jesus cries out. But I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. Jesus seems to be very adamant here. This is obviously an issue that is near and dear to his heart, a teaching he wants all people to be living out. Quick poll, who here is currently doing that? Loving the people who detest you. This is the big difference between us and Jesus. We don't see people as he did. He's able to look at others, even his most ardent critics, with compassion. Let me put it to you this way. Jesus loves the people we hate, and he tells us we need to bless them too. And our response to that is, nah. Our default mode is to show contempt to people we disagree with. This is true, especially in an election year. Picture someone who's on the polar opposite side of a political issue than you. What happens when you encounter them? You bump into them at the mailbox. You see a sign in their front lawn. You stand behind them at the grocery store or glare across a dinner table at them. How does it affect you? You silently avoid the issue if you're lucky. You sneak around the minefield, hoping you don't get blown up by politics. Other times, however, This inner weaponizing is a gradual but undeniable process. I think Methodism's founder John Wesley came up with a novel way to describe it. In the journal entry we've been studying in this web series, his third point emphasizes that people, particularly those who are preparing for an election, should take care that their spirits were not sharpened against those who voted on the other side. That's powerful imagery, don't you think? Comparing a person's innermost sacred self to weapons like swords and knives that cut, kill, and maim? The human spirit's meant for much more than that. It's the means by which people relate to each other and to the divine. There's no deeper connection than a soulful bond, my friends. Sure, when we use it as a weapon, it feels good for a little bit. Owning the person from party A makes you feel strong, or making the person from party B cry is a moment of triumph. Those are actual slogans I've seen on yard signs and bumper stickers, by the way. Although, it must be said, people from all political persuasions feel similarly. I have two questions in response. First, who really gets hurt when you wield a sharpened soul against your enemy? Sure, you might get a small dig in on the opposition, but all too often, you're gonna hurt yourself more. If you don't endure an argument, a fight, or some other immediate consequence, you're still setting yourself up for long-term failure. That's because hitting the enemy is going to make your enemy come right back at you. It's going to become the proverbial eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth from Hammurabi's code. Hating your enemy leads to constant warfare, in other words. And in warfare, everyone, including the victors, suffer vicious losses. I thought a pastor named John Pavlovitz put it brilliantly in a blog post he wrote. Living this way can so easily become toxic, he writes. So easily a heart pollutant, to the point where we are no longer fighting to right wrongs, or to protect people, or to bring change. We are fighting simply to fight, to injure, to damage. This is what happens when contempt replaces compassion as our default response to our enemies. My second question, 
What would Jesus say about all this? What would he do knowing that his followers are all too often on the front lines sharpening their spirits to find stabbing points? We already know what Jesus would say, actually. Before his teaching on enemies that we heard in Matthew, Jesus says this, You've heard the law that says punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, author the other cheek also. If you are being sued in court for your shirt and it's taken from you, give them your coat as well. What Jesus is saying here is he wants us to avoid the vicious cycles that comes when we sharpen a soul against an enemy. And if we claim faith in Christ, scripture tells us that we need to see our enemies as God sees us broken, vulnerable, hurting people in need of compassion. I know, does this make it easier? No way. But following Jesus' words makes it worth it in the end. For if we can love our enemies as hard as that is, it leaves paths open for relationship. Forgiveness happens. Redemption becomes possible. New creation can emerge when enemies come together as opposed to unending war. You don't have to like that person, as the old saying goes, but you have to love them. So how can we do this as the campaign season draws to a close? Well, I think not gloating over a win is a good place to start. Instead of waking up the morning after the election and immediately crowing about one side or the other, why not dull the blade of your soul by being empathetic to the other side? The Dalai Hello. Lama calls this practicing warm-heartedness. Note the phrasing there. Practice means this is an activity you have to do regularly and repeatedly to become proficient at. Expounding physical effort and energy is required to love your enemies. Faith in action is another way to say this, which is as big a Wesleyan buzz phrase as you'll ever find. John Wesley was all about putting belief into praxis, balancing holiness with ministry. I think it's why he concluded his election advice with this tidbit. He knew there would be no more important outcome from an election than the electorate seeing and loving one another afterwards. So as hard as this is, let's start the process now and live it especially on November 4th and beyond. If you can blunt your soul from becoming a sword, it can instead be used as a plow to help seeds of something new be sown. Love your enemies, folks. Pray for those who persecute you. Translate those acts into the seeing of dignity in one another, listening to your opponent, and we will move to that point where the government of the United States becomes what the founders dreamed of, one that is truly inclusive of all people, and forever striving to be one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.